Good morning. Happy Sunday to you. Welcome to the bridge. It is the last Sunday of May, and we are excited. We are unveiling our comeback plan today at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live. We're going to share it with you and answer any questions that you have. So you want to make sure to get on here later today on Facebook at 6 o'clock, and we'll be there answering any of your questions. Today is also Pentecost Sunday. It's a day we just remember and celebrate the Holy Spirit. He is our helper. He is our friend. He's our comforter and our guide. And so we are just uh, celebrating that today and are excited for this morning. Would you check out this video? Well, good morning. Welcome to the bridge. We hope you are having an amazing Sunday. We're going to have some fun up here praising Jesus. And I invite you to sing along with us. Join us in clapping and raising your hands and lifting your voices to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. He is so worthy of your praise and he is excited to join with you, to, to spend time with you. So sing with us.
taste I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Not the sound of the symphony to my ears. It's like holy
you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you take us. I thank you that you take us in our weakest moments. You take us with our flaws. And you say, I, I will help. I will be there for you. Would you just come and sit at my feet and let me take control. Let me help you. So Jesus, that is my heart's desire this morning. We come into your holies of holies and just ask that you would, Lord, would you do what only you can do? You know exactly what we need and we just come and sit at your feet and worship you. Once again, God, I dedicate my heart and my life to you. We come and worship in truth. We come and worship in humility and in love. Praise your name. Would you sing this with me? The king of my heart. Lord, you're good. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are.
Jesus, because you are good. We celebrate your name because you are good. Even though there is division in our nation, even though there is, there is division and hate in our world, you are good. So we will forever declare your praise. We will forever show our love and our devotion to the King of Kings because God, you are good. What the enemy comes to, to bring disunity and disruption, you come and bring peace. And would you come now, Jesus, the King of our hearts, and unite us together under one name, the name above every name, that name of Jesus. Jesus, come, be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and so be it. Hi, Bridge family. This is Jennifer Satterly, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all so much for your amazing generosity. That is definitely one thing that I love about the bridge. You guys are so generous, not just through your giving of money, but through your time and talents, and we appreciate you so much. If any of you are wondering how you can give while we're not together in the building, you can go on our website at thebridgewv.church slash give or you can of course also mail in a payment. Thank you so much again for your generosity and I just wanna pray with you over our offering. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the generosity of this church. Thank you for the way that you've covered us in this time. Please be with every family that's represented here. Bless them and protect them. And please use what we give back to you in a mighty way. In Jesus name I pray, amen. Hello, Bridge family. I hope your day has started off great. We are so thankful you're joining us. Whether you are new to the bridge or have been here for years, we believe you are at the right place and at the right time. God loves you and he wants to work in your life to impact the lives of others. We also extend a very warm welcome to anyone here for their first, second, or third time. We would love to get to know you better, so if you go to our eConnect card at thebridgewb.church slash guest and tell us more about yourself, that would be amazing. If you would like prayer or are ready to give, you can also find these on our website, thebridgewv.church, or click the links in the comments section of our online platform. During Midpoint, we surpassed the halfway point of Philippians, and just like that, we are closing in on the conclusion. Thank you everyone for making Midpoint a part of your week. Starting June 17th, we are making a few tweaks to Midpoint. Most importantly, we are making Midpoint an in-person opportunity. We will be following the state requested social distancing guidelines, but we are very excited and encouraged to gather together again. If you have missed this awesome gathering, make sure to join us this week as we continue through Philippians. It, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. we are live on Facebook. Make a point to join us, and if you ever miss a week, you can always catch up by finding them on our Facebook feed. Stay tuned. Next week, we are going to let you know two opportunities we have to be the hands and feet of Jesus in June and July. There are exciting days ahead. Last week, we asked families with the high school or college graduate to email Pastor Joel four to six pictures of your graduate. We have received several responses, but would like even more. With this, we are extending the deadline to Tuesday, June 2nd. Please include pictures from all stages of life, and please let us know where they are graduated from and what they are doing in the fall. Email the info to joel at thebridgewv.church. I hope you are having an amazing week, and we look forward to connecting with you at one of our online gatherings. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know many of you are as excited as I am to get back into the building. And even today, we are prepping for our return to the building. And rest assured, for those that are not yet ready to come back, we are thinking of you as well. So whether you find yourself ready to gather back again, we are here. And maybe you need some more time at home. We'll be there too. We love you guys and know and believe that we are better together. We're in our third part of our five-week series of Stand, as we look at five different stories from the Old Testament book of Daniel and learn how to stand up for what matters most 
in our life. If you missed last week, I would encourage you to go check it out at thebridgewv.church. And we talked about standing firm. And next week, we're going to be talking about standing strong in the face of opposition. But today, today we're going to talk about standing up. We have people in our lives that we love that will have or they are going to make unwise decisions. And God is going to use you to be his voice in their lives, to stand up for what is right and help lead them back to the right path. Let's pray as we get started. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, that in this time that we're in, in this season, it does not take you by surprise, even though it may take us. And Lord, whether we're energized in this time or whether we're exhausted from this time, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, I pray that you would continue to do a work in us as you are challenging us to stand and to stand up. Lord, we thank you for the life of Daniel. We thank you for the example that he gives to us to be able to honor you in our lives. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. On our one-year anniversary of the church, we had a leadership meeting with my boss. Lindsay and myself and all of our leaders were there. And to say that this was the most difficult meeting of my entire life would be an understatement by far. For over two hours, my boss let there be a session of the airing of grievances. So people <laughs> gladly took advantage of it. So I want, I want you to hear me on two things. First, I gave people ample, ample opportunity to have grievances to be able to air. And second, I was at a place in my life where I thought I was right and I was God's gift to the bridge. I would love to believe that I've grown leaps and bounds from that time. But people one by one begin to air those grievances. My character was challenged and someone said that they really liked my wife, but they couldn't stand me all that much. Grievance, grievances for the most part that were unshared with me personally, but willing to be shared in a group of about 25 people. If I'm being honest with you, it felt more like a pseudo intervention or a lynching than it did a meeting. Why am I sharing this with you? Well, it's not to get your pity, although... On that day of that year, I would have loved to have had your pity. No, it's because there are two types of people in our lives and in the world. There are those that are hyper-confrontational. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're waiting for someone to say something wrong so that you can swoop in and correct them, especially if it's in front of a group of people. It's usually less about helping another person and more about being right and them being wrong. Those that are confrontational in this way are seen as bullies and domineering. They're viewed as judgmental and often lack grace. And then there are those that are more passive on the other side as the pendulum swings. And if I tend to land on one side or the other, it is usually confrontational. And I'm learning how to do that better, but I've had the share of uh, my share of passive people in my life. My wife is more on the passive side. Why? Well, according to the Enneagram, she is a peacemaker. And nine times out of ten, she wants to be passive for the sake of relationship, for the sake of, of people being together. And, and when left untapped, being passive can easily turn into passive aggressiveness. Passive aggressive people drive me crazy. Can I get an Amen. Passive individuals are often seen as doormats and are often taken advantage of. They are viewed as soft and as lock, lacking backbone. So what's the answer? Well, we see that Paul challenges us to speak the truth in love. In Ephesians 4, verse 15, in the message translation, he says, God wants us to grow up. You ever feel like that? You want to just say to someone, grow up, grow up, stop doing what you're doing. Just grow up. To grow up, to know the whole truth, and to tell it in love like Christ in everything. And that really is the core. One of our values at the bridge is that we are Jesus-centered. And Jesus is the center of everything that we do. He's the center of every relationship. He's the center of every confrontation. He's the center of all of the things that are going on in our life. And as we confront, there can often be two confrontational extremes. The, on one end of the spectrum is those that confront unlovingly. Maybe you've never experienced that, but if you have, you are fully aware of what I'm talking about. 
Early off on in our marriage, I feared for my safety, not because I was afraid of my wife, but because when she saw injustice, it is this natural reaction in her life that she would speak out. The problem was, is that the people that she was often speaking out to were much larger than I was, and they're not going to punch a girl. It wasn't always in the right time. I would tell her to be quiet because I was afraid and I did not want to deal with that. And I heard confronting unlovingly compared with a drive-by shooting that while a drive-by may hit their target, there's a lot of collateral da- damage that often happens in those situations. And at what level are we okay with collateral damage? As we unlovingly confront people, what level uh, is, is it worth a broken relationship, but maybe a broken marriage, a broken parent and child relationship, an employer employer relationship? I'm reminded that we are called to do two things. That's it. Jesus narrows it down. There's 600 and some laws that the Jews were required to keep, and Moses had the 10 that he shared with the children of Israel, and Jesus narrows all of those down into two. He says, you love the Lord with everything that you are and you love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can do those two things, you will have mastered what it is to live here on this earth. And after sitting through that meeting, I, uh, I would have considered myself not feeling very loved. Actually, I spent the year, next year praying. At, actually, it wasn't less praying. It was more like begging, begging God to let us the heck up out of here. On one side, there's, there's those that confront unlovingly. On the other side is those that are unwilling to confront. When Lindsay would speak up, I fell into this category. I remember saying to her, this isn't my fight. Mostly because I didn't want to get beat up, but we can rationalize it. This isn't my fight. Even this week, we're seeing things um, uh, that are coming up online, people dying and, and communities gathering together for uh, the injustice that is happening. And it's easy for us to, to be unwilling to confront in those situations where it matters. We can rationalize it. Well, that's not in our neighborhood. As I've talked to other pastors about their reopen plans, um, the, the, one of the responses that I've gotten is, well, that's not how it is here. Some people would say, well, who am I to judge? I have my own baggage. I have my own things. I I don't need to be dealing with other people. But here's the reality. To love God and to love people, confrontation is going to have to be a part of our lives. So for those of you that are listening today that are unwilling to confront, confrontation must be a part of your life and you're gonna have to figure out how to do it because Jesus tells us that we are called to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers. And there's a difference. I'd encourage you to Google it if you want to know the difference between peacekeeper and peacemaker. I don't have time to dive into all of that today. But confrontation is going to be a part of our lives. Why? Because we're all prone to missteps. We're all prone to, to make the wrong decisions, to make the wrong choices. And we're all called to lift one another up. So not only do we all mess up, but then we're all in this together, that we all have to build one another up. We need to learn to confront in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. Being right is not one of those reasons. Maybe you're a parent who as a child is making bad decisions. We, we must learn when and how to step in and to push them, but not push them so hard that they, they run away but give them enough space that will allow them to come back to God. Maybe you have a family member, a close friend who's making poor financial decisions. God may be calling you to be the voice of reason in their lives. Maybe you have someone in your life that struggles with addictions, with alcohol or drugs or sexual, and God is calling you to help them see God's grace from a non-judgmental point of view. Maybe you have a friend that already has three cats and they want to get two more. For the sake of God, do not let them get two more cats. You do not want to be the person, I'm just kidding, if you have four cats, Jesus still loves you. But I just want to remind you that Carol Baskin has more than three cats. We talked last week about this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, one that Saddam Hussein 
would have uh, characterized himself in that he called himself the son of Nebuchadnezzar. That is the level of evilness that Nebuchadnezzar carried upon his life. He was horrible in the way that he treated people, uh, ripped them from their homelands, ripped them from their families, indoctrinated them into the life of the uh, Babylonian Empire. The crazy part is that Nebuchadnezzar, over the years, Nebuchadnezzar saw God work and God move in miraculous ways. Daniel and his friends stood head and shoulders above the rest of the group. Yet over time, his heart become, became calloused. This is decade after Daniel and the boys came to Babylon. Most scholars believe there was about 30 years since that had transpired. And God gives Nebuchadnezzar this crazy dream. You ever have crazy dreams? I, I often have them and I'll wake up and I'll try to tell Lindsay and she'll be like, that makes no sense. And then I'll get up and get ready and I'll try to remember what my dreams are. And, and I can never seem to remember my dreams after I wake up and get out of bed. But that didn't happen in Nebuchadnezzar. This dream was etched into his mind and he wanted it. He wanted it interpreted. He calls the wise men. He calls the magicians. He calls the enchanters, the astrologers, the fortune tellers. Daniel 4, 7 says, I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was known to be cruel and kings were known to kill the ones that were bringing the message, which is why that we have the phrase today, don't, don't shoot the messenger. The verse doesn't specifically say they couldn't do it, but more like that they wouldn't do it because they were afraid for their lives as you dig into the Hebrew. They were passing the buck. You ever do that before? Instead of dealing with the confrontation ahead of you, you just pass the buck onto somebody else and let somebody else deal with it. So the king calls Daniel in because Daniel, we read back in Daniel 1 that he had been given this gift of interpreting dreams. And in 419, he says, Upon hearing this, Daniel, who is also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time and frightened by the meaning of the dream. Not not by the meaning, not like, oh man, that dream is scary. No, what I have to tell the king is the scary part. Then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Daniel was thinking, that's easy for you to say. You're on the other end of that sword that drops in the guillotine. You don't have to give bad news to the king. He tells the king that he wishes that it were about his enemies. That's never a good sign. Daniel keeps going. He's making the decision to stand up when all the others had backed down or passed the buck. You see, Daniel had been serving this king for 30 years. And whether Nebuchadnezzar was in the right all the time or in the wrong, made good decisions or bad decisions, Daniel still honored him and his authority. We get to see someone stand up in, in a loving way, speaking the truth in love because of love. And then Daniel lays this bombshell on him, the truth. In Daniel 4.22, it says that tree, he, he gives him the dream and there's a tree in it. And he says, that tree, your majesty, is you. Then he begins to translate the dream. You'll be driven away from people and it will take you seven years until you acknowledge that God is the one true God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar said that, that Daniel had, uh, that Daniel was head and shoulders above him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then, and then we saw last week that they were standing firm in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar is the one that said, honor the Lord God, don't no one speak against him. And so Daniel gives this uh, statement to him that it's gonna take him seven years till he acknowledges that God is the one true God, that, that at one point in time, Nebuchadnezzar was making that very statement with his mouth, but over time and through circumstances, his heart had begun to move away. In verse 426, uh, verse 26, chapter four, he says, but the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you'll receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. Daniel could have stopped there. He could have stopped there. He could have, he completed the task at hand. He, he interpreted the dream for the king. But Daniel wasn't content with that. He knew he had to stand up. What Daniel did next came at the potential cost of his life. This isn't the first time, though, that he's had this be the potential cost of his life. 
Why? Because Daniel loved the king. Even with all of his defects and shortcomings, he still loved the king. Daniel asked the king to accept his advice. Did he not know that this wasn't how it worked? Kings, kings don't seek the advice from, from peons that serve underneath them. Remember, they shoot the messenger. In verse 27, he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. And then he gives some of the most profound advice that you find in all of Scripture. Stop sinning and do what is right. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. I mean, Daniel just summed up pretty much every confrontation that has ever happened. Stop sinning and do what is right. I mean, just think about it in our life. Those struggles that we have, stop sinning and do what is right. With the relationship, the confrontation that we would have with relationships, whether that be our spouse or our kids, our parents, a coworker, stop sinning. And pride is one of those of the choosing to want to be right. Stop sinning and do what is right. Not be right. He doesn't say stop sinning and be right. He says do what is right. We may mask it in different words or phrases, but at its core, this is it. Around the same time of my pseudo-intervention, James Ackley invited me to lunch. He had written this carefully crafted message and handed it to me over lunch. And as I sat there and read it while our food was waiting to come, if I'm being honest with you, it was extremely uncomfortable. Confrontation in any form is uncomfortable. But this letter had something different than that meeting had. It was marked with love, and James was speaking the truth in love. You see, in that letter, there were four or five things on that list. All of them were shortcomings in my life and in my leadership. The difference between the two meetings was life transformational. You see, one made me question whether we made the right decision to move to West Virginia, and the other helped me become in part the man that I am today, the leader that I am today. And we're not always going to get it right, but with people like James Ackley in our lives, we can become more like Jesus. Paul shares with us in Galatians 6 what Daniel did with the king uh, in verse 1, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, and we, when we think of that word sin, we think of like the grotesque things. We think of sexual sin or we think of addictions. But pride is a sin. Complaining is a sin. Gossiping is a sin. I mean, there are a lot of things that fall into that category. It's not just the, the nasty ones that are on the high on, the, on that list says, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path and be careful not to fall in the same temptation yourself. So how do we, according to Paul's words, how do we stand up? How do we confront in love? The first way is that we do it gently and humbly. This speaks to a deep love. This isn't I'm right and you're wrong. This isn't you do this or I'm going to bolt or whatever that looks like. It's, it's spoken in love. If we're doing life together, which is how we are designed, I mean, you go back to Genesis and you read that, that God formed the perfect creation and he breathed life into him. And one of the things that, that God said is it's not good for man to be alone. From the very beginning, relationship was a part of our lives. It's how we're designed and we need to walk with gentleness and humility in our lives. We don't ever do this as one who is above the other. We don't do this as one that has it all together because you may think you have it all together or you may look like you have it all together, but you don't. You may hide your deficiencies well, but they're still there. 
I got to mention this firsthand a few weeks ago. I mentioned that Lindsay and I were firmly asked to change something that we were doing in our lives. My old self would have retaliated because uh, they were out of line in how they did it, but rather Lindsay, with gentleness and humility, approached this person in love. Lindsay confronted with gentleness and humility, even though that wasn't what was expressed to us. Our goal isn't to be right. Our goal isn't to have it our way, but to be people of restoration. Sometimes you sacrifice being right to help people become right with God. And sometimes we think things matter, but in the scope of eternity, they don't. I learned from my two experiences that how we approach the situation matters. So when I go back and look at that first year, I made a lot of mistakes. But how those two situations were approached to Lindsay and I were two drastically different measures. One caused me to want to run away from the calling of God in my life. And one helped me become a better leader, a better husband, a better dad, a better friend, a better person. Lindsay used to tell me a lot that I could be right and wrong at the same time. I could be right, but I could be wrong in how I go about being right. I was told on my wedding day that I could be right or I could be happy and to choose well. And in a relationship, as we stand up, we can choose to be right or we can choose to love. You see, being right often comes from a judgmental heart and choosing to love comes from grace. I mean, think about all the times that Jesus could have chosen to be right. When he was arrested, he could have chosen to be right. When he was on trial, he could have chosen to be right. When he was belittled, he could have chosen to be right, but he didn't. He chose to love instead. Grace that has been given so freely to you and to me is the grace that flows out of us to other people. And sometimes, sometimes I think we forget about the grace that flows so freely to us and we hold other people to standards that we're unwilling to hold ourselves to. And the second thing that that Paul shares in that passage is that we have to be careful not to trip ourselves You see, when we confront other people, the enemy works overtime in our life. It's like he flips it into a new gear and he just goes after it. Why? Because he wants to see relationships destroyed. His plan is to steal, to kill, and destroy. When we confront others, he's he's like, yes, let's get in there. Let's, Let's create that division. If that weren't the case, there wouldn't be church splits all over this nation, all over the world. And then there's the potential in our lives of becoming prideful because when we step in and we bring correction to other people, we can think better of ourselves. Matthew 7, Jesus tells of a story, and I'm really excited in midpoint, uh, starting in June, when we gather back together again um, on Wednesday nights, we'll be starting on the 17th of June, getting together. We're going to start in the book of Matthew. We're finishing up Philippians on June 10th, and on June 17th, we're jumping in. And I cannot wait to go through the Sermon on the Mount. It's my favorite passage of Scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in that, he, um, he tells a story about a man that's looking at a, a speck in somebody else's eye while there's a log coming out of his own eye. And, he, and, and Jesus says, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? And, and we often become so prideful because we've done such a good job creating a facade in our life that, that we look like we have it all together. But as we're not much different than the Pharisees that the outside looked really good, but the inside of the cup was dirty. We aren't trying to point out other people's shortcomings. We're trying to lift them to God. That's our, that's our goal. That's our object, objective. So what happens to this king? I mean, we, we saw that Daniel said, listen, you're going to take seven years. 
And, and if that was me, I'd be like, well, I'm going to shorten that. I want to do that now. But does he immediately change his way and, and get on his knees and say, Lord, forgive me and change his heart? No, he does not. So we pick up in verse 34. After this time, the seven years had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned. Notice that there's, when, when we step out of the will of God, that there's, he's saying that his sanity returned. When we allow ourselves to walk in discontentment, when we allow ourselves to walk in, in jealousy and greed and envy, then, then we walk away from the will of God and we're walking outside what some would say our sanity, as Nebuchadnezzar said. That's just the Jake translation there, the, the footnote. And I praised and I worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. And the people of this earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. And my advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored as the head of my kingdom and with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and glorify and honor the King of heaven. All of his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. He is able to humble the proud. That's how he finishes that statement out because Nebuchadnezzar became, I mean, you would have thought that that would have already happened with the gold statue. But time has a way of working on us. The longer that we are in power, the longer that we're in church, we can become calloused and we can become prideful. So what do I take away from this? I'm not responsible for the outcome or their response. I'm only responsible for my approach. My approach is to speak the truth in love. It's not to dismiss confrontation. It's not to confront unwillingly. It's to confront in love to speak truth in love. And today my challenge is for us is that we would be available. Available to be a small part of reconciling or restoration work in, in, of Jesus in people's lives. Willing to step out of our comfort zone, willing to step into their world, into their shoes, to share the very heart of Jesus with them in their lives with humbleness and gentleness. As we shared earlier today, at the start of service, today is Pentecost Sunday. And, and so as I am reminded, listen, in my, in my flesh, there's some stuff that even happened this week that in my flesh I wanted to celebrate because I was vindicated of something. But in my heart, the realization that it's still not done yet. The reconciliation is still not over. And for me in my life, the, the way that I'm a better pastor, the way that I'm a better dad, the way that I'm a better husband, the way that I'm a better person is through the Holy Spirit. And it all started on the day of Pentecost as they gathered together in that room and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so I know that some of you may be weirded out about that. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about and you've been there. But, but if the Holy Spirit is new to you, I just want to challenge you in this, in this time that we're in. This fall, I'm really excited. We're going to be spending some time talking about the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the, the Holy Spirit is often the forgotten part of the Trinity. We have God, the Father who created the world. We have God, the Son who came to save the world. And then we've been given this gift, as Jesus calls it. And that's what he says, there's this gift. It's this gift to us to be able to journey through this life. Because yes, Jesus is our saving grace. But the Holy Spirit empowers us to share that saving grace with those that are around us. In how we talk and in how we live. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who can guide and direct and shape and mold. Lord, that who can take broken vessels like me and like you 
and can begin to put them back together on the potter's wheel. Lord, I pray that in every living room, in every place that people are listening this to, in their car, uh, wherever they are, Lord, that, that they would be reminded today that, that of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, they would, they would receive that gift today. Lord, Lord, when we said yes to you, the Holy Spirit was with us, but inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives giving up our will, saying the words of Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. And when we make that statement, when we make that proclamation, our life becomes different. We're leading and living for a different reason. Lord, I, I pray for marriages today. Lord, as confrontation arises, Lord, I pray for marriages to see restoration because confrontation is done in a loving way. Lord, uh, that, that we would learn to be men and women that would speak the truth in love. Lord, I pray for the prodigals today, Lord, that, that for those that um, either have been overbearing in their confrontation or those that have not confront, confronted at all, Lord, I pray that moms and dads today would, would be willing to, to step into that place of confrontation in love, that they would stand up because they love their kids. Lord, we pray for friends and for relationships that have been broken, and I pray for reconciliation of relationships. Lord, I pray that uh, men and women and boys and girls will be reconciled to those that they care about. As we speak the truth in love, as we, we honor you and honor them in the process. Lord, we pray for those that are hearing God's voice this morning those that may believe in Jesus but have not yet chosen to allow you to be the Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, I pray this morning, wherever they are, Lord, that they would make that decision that it's not their lives anymore. Lord, that they recognize that you are their Lord and Savior. Lord, and we pray today for those that are sitting in rooms with family and friends that are listening today that have yet to make a decision to believe. Lord, we thank you that they're here today, Lord, and I pray that, that today you would begin to do a work in their life. Lord, that sometimes we have to walk through those seasons of like Nebuchadnezzar did, to walk through those years of, of, of losing our sanity only to come back to you. Lord, and I pray that, that those that would be in that place today, that they wouldn't wait those seven years, but they would experience your truth and your grace today. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, today I just want to declare a few things over you. I declare that we are children of the Most High God, that we are peacemakers and not peacekeepers, that we walk in gentleness and humility, drawing others to Jesus. I declare freedom today from addictions of alcohol and drugs and pornography. I declare that marriages are restored and children are returned to their fathers and mothers. I declare that as we confront in love, that people will know the truth and the truth will set them free. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you join us as we head back into worship this morning? Led me through the 
the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness. in you. May he continue to do more and more in your life and in your heart as you seek him. Have a blessed day. Have an awesome day. God bless you.